Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Church Dogmatics by Emil Bruner. We're going to take a look at the conclusion, very powerful conclusion, to chapter 11 on the saving work of Christ. Let's go to block one and begin with forgiveness as a real historical event. And that's critical. It's an event of messianic authority. Jeremiah 31. Behold, I make a new covenant. A covenant from Christ's mission of authority. Where in Mark 2.10 we're told that he forgave sins in his own name. His sayings became commentary on his actions. So Brunner says, what we look at historically is an event of sayings and actions. Death on the cross and divine forgiveness were seen together by the church after the resurrection experiences. So through the resurrection, death on the cross was coupled with divine forgiveness. And that was expressed by the theology of Paul. But Paul, he transcended the idea of the atoning sacrificial system. Paul talked about the cross and resurrection delivering us from the curse of the law, liberating believers from spiritual darkness. And what happened to Paul? What happened to Saul? He was liberated from the works righteousness of the law. And he was uh, healed of spiritual darkness, spiritual blindness in a uh, Damascus. So as Brunner says, we must interpret the cross as historical event of forgiveness as liberation. Through God's reconciling action, we are truly forgiven. And it's a gift of grace. It's not works. It's a gift of grace in Christ. Forgiveness becomes a historical matter of course. It's not an idea that we uh, conceptualize and internalize. No, it's a, it's a ontological. It's, a, it's a, an ontological reality. It's, a, it's forgiveness as genuine historical reality that uh, becomes the motion of the Holy Spirit, a matter of course. So we must understand Forgiveness as revelation, says Brunner, through God's intervening grace, which changes the human condition. Forgiveness becomes an historical event, the Christ event. And when I use the term Christ event, I mean ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension. Okay, Christ event is ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension. And that is forgiveness as a historical event. Through the word of Christ, an event of transcendent divine intervention. Remember, neo-Orthodox theology emphasizes the transcendence of God, something liberals deny to this day. Bruner says, like Bart, Bruner says there is a realm of transcendence and uh, the cross and resurrection are evidence of God's transcendence breaking into our realm of historical finitude. So it is a, a genuinely an event of transcendent divine intervention. And it's reconciliation taking place through the agape, self-sacrificial action of God. And uh, Bruner goes to Philippians 2, and I love that he goes to Philippians 2, the kenosis pa passage where Christ emptied himself of co-equality with the Father, humbled himself, becoming a servant, and was faithful as that servant even unto the torture of the cross. And I like what Brunner says here. He did that to penetrate to the very depth of human existence to the very negative depth of human existence in order to 
rescue those who are lost. To the very negative depth of human existence, Christ entered in to the curse of the cross for reconciliation of the lost. And then he goes to uh, Romans 3.25, combining objective atonement and subjective faith together, where man identifies himself and Christos in Christ. Paul used that expression over 600 times in his letters. To live is to live in Christ. To die is to die in Christ. Whether we live or whether we die, we shall remain in Christ. Therefore, we are confident that we shall never be separated from Christ because in the cross of Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit took up separation into the Godhead itself and overcame that separation through resurrection. Therefore, all those who live in Christos, all those in Christ shall never suffer separation from our personal Father in heaven. God in heaven, our personal Father in heaven. But Paul taught that theological position over 600 times in his letters. Let's move on to block two and take a look at uh, personalism. What does Bruner stand for? What did Bart stand for? What does Bruner stand for? What did Jürgen Moltmann stand for? They all three stood for divine authority as visible and personal. Visible in Jesus as the Christ. Personal in that only Christ as person could reveal God as personal. Only Christ as person could restore lost personal relationship with God. The original covenant at creation was a covenant of personal relationship lost due to sin. Then came the uh, intermediate uh, time of the law that mediated between God and humanity. But now in Christ, personal relationship with God has been restored. So Bart, Bruner, Jürgen Moltmann, all three declared divine divine authority as visible and personal. Visible love and righteousness expressed in the atonement of the cross. And the doctrine of of atonement, it is a, a position held by the Reformation, and it's a position held even in the first century. It was kind of linked up, remember, in our previous lesson, is kind of interpreted through the uh, uh, sacrificial system uh, of Judaism. It was a Jewish interpretation to begin with, but it began. Uh, be- it became expressed again in the Reformation, and we affirm a doctrine of atonement today. So, love and righteous- righteousness are expressed in the atonement of the cross, becoming the center of the New Testament. The cross itself becomes a sign of our faith. The giving of the Son is embraced by the church. So what is the uh, kingly rule of Christ like? Well, it's personal as a new type of royal rule in judgment and mercy within the new age of Irene peace. What is the Greek concept Irene? It translates... It translates healing of fragmentation. Christ inaugurates an age of healing fragmented individuals, healing a fragmented society, healing a fragmented humanity. Christ ushers in a new age of peace. Within, Brunner says, a personalistic view of God. The disciples asked Christ, how do we pray? And Christ said, begin personally, begin with our Father. 
our Father in heaven. So block two, note three, visible and personal in inaugurating the new age. Christ inaugurates the new kingdom, not just proclaiming a new kingdom. He's more than a prophet. He inaugurates the new kingdom in his own personhood. He confronts us with decision as the incarnate will of God. Offering kingdom as a gift and presenting himself as a forgiving presence who welcomed tax collectors, who welcomed uh, women, uh, women of ill repute. Christ welcomed the outcasts of society. He was a forgiving presence. He created true and continues to create true communion. Christ, his rule is a rule of agape, self-sacrificial love, exercising that power of agape through forgiveness. And we all know the power of forgiveness. It's a tremendous power. That uh, concept, it's more than a word, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a reality. Well, we can't even describe that reality, the reality of forgiveness, what it can accomplish. Uh, it's amazing. And especially when that forgiveness comes from the Christ. So let's move on to block through block, block three, and uh, we conclude with a. Uh, then comes the eschatological end, and I love this because he starts right out. Bruner starts right out with my favorite passage. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. I actually have many, but Philippians two is one. So then comes the eschatological end through kenosis. Self-emptying, kenosis. Kenosis in the Greek translates self-emptying. Empty the self, enter into humility, enter into becoming a servant. Through kenosis, Philippians 2, 6 through 10, a kenosis pass passage which ends as that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ as Lord. Hostile forces have been overcome by the cross and the resurrection together. Dominion becomes completed in 1 Corinthians 12, 15, 24. Then comes the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to the Father. And this eschatolog eschatological end comes through the hearts of mankind. Christ rules in the heart of persons. And it is not fully realized. It's in a process of becoming. The Holy Spirit is transitioning from dunamis to energia. The kingdom is moving forward, but it's not yet fully realized because Christ seeks free decision, free obedience to God. This takes place within Christ. His kingship fulfills the law with agape, self-sacrificial love. And uh, it takes place where the heart confesses Christ. It's an internal experience. It's a personal experience. It's an internal being born from above. It's an internal new birth from above. Remember, in the Greek, uh, in the Gospel of John, born again is the English translation we have in our Bibles, but in the Greek, it translates born from above. And that's what takes place when Christ rules in the heart. We are born from above to confess inwardly in the heart Christ as Lord. And it's through the freedom of confession. The church is the correlate of Christ's lordship. And how does that happen? 
through proclamation, through love, and through service, which is always in the process of becoming. The church is in the process of becoming also. In the cross and the resurrection, we have the revelation of atonement and lordship. Both atonement and lordship. And don't let any progressive liberal theologian out there today tell you that the atonement is not true. The doctrine of the atonement is true and real and verified by the apostolic witness in scripture and the progressive theologians, the liberal progressive theologians, miss the point entirely because they don't accept scripture as authoritative and then reject the doctrine of atonement. But I'm here to tell you that uh, the cross and the resurrection, I agree with Brunner, the cross and the resurrection reveal atonement and lordship and the removal of spiritual blindness. All of that is a tremendous conclusion to chapter 11 on the saving work of Christ. And next time, we will go to the person of Christ, 322 to 332, chapter 12. We're going to start chapter 12, 322 to 332, on the person of Christ. Only the person of Christ could reveal and restore personal relationship with a personal God. We believe in a personal God. Christ revealed personalism. Call God our Father in heaven. That'll wrap up 293 to 307, and we'll pick up in chapter 12 next lesson.